we've got a great panel uh, with some tremendous experience. And I'm sure you're going to find their insights um, fascinating. Hopefully not perhaps what you might expect. And uh, maybe even a little bit of uh, controversy. Um, in thinking about the actual title here, I thought we'd just get a little general view about profitability overall in, uh, in the fintech sector. And um, just a simple question to throw out and get a, get a quick view on, which is what, why is profitability so hard to achieve with fintechs in particular? Indeed, is it? Um, hi, I'm Valentina. I work for Oak North. Um, I don't think that it's particularly difficult to achieve. I mean, you have to obviously work hard for it, but within Oak North, we reached cash flow break even in our 11th month. Um, in our second full year of operations, 2017, we made 10.6 million pre tax profit. And last year, we increased that 220% to 33.9 million pounds. So we haven't sacrificed growth. You know, the Silicon Valley myth that you have to, you know, sacrifice profits in order to pursue growth. We've lent 3 billion in the UK. We've scaled to a 2.8 billion valuation. We've raised over a billion dollars in investment from the likes of SoftBank's Vision Fund. So we definitely haven't sacrificed growth and we are a profitable FinTech. So I disagree with that. Sentence. So that's the myth debunked. In <laughs> Introduce yourself. Sure, there. hi, I'm Jackie Rhesus. I'm uh, from San Francisco and I run uh, Square Capital. And um, if you're not familiar with Square and Square Capital, um, Square started as a payments business with the original iconic dongle, if you remember the little white dongle, and has evolved fairly significantly over the course of the past 10 years to evolve from a core payments business to a broad suite of um, services that support small businesses. And that could be lending, it could be invoice services, it could be gift cards and loyalty, it could be vertical points of sale on one end. And then in addition to that, we have a fantastic app that's now in the UK called Cash App. And Cash App is an ecosystem in its own right, has 15 million monthly users. And Cash App started as a peer-to-peer -peer payments business and again has evolved where you could buy and sell Bitcoin. And um, um, it has a, a virtual card that you could use as a debit card as part of the peer-to-peer uh, payment system. And I actually think it's very hard to extrapolate an overall model to an industry as broad as fintech. And I think it's like saying financial services companies can't be profitable. I think if you actually look at the specifics of an individual industry, and then even within an industry within companies, I think there are kernels of brilliance around certain business models that have been created across fintech, um, whether that's some of the UK fintech companies, which are incredibly impressive, um, or the myriad of players in the United States, you know, from very small to very large. And so there are lots of places where unit economic uh, profitability has been achieved very early on. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, in some cases, people make deliberate choices where they want to lean into revenue growth um, and, and focus more on acquisition and distribution first before focusing on monetization. And I think those choices are very bespoke to an actual company as opposed to an industry overall. Oh, sure. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Gonzalo. I'm the founder of Syndicate Room and CEO. And um, Syndicate Room is an online investment platform, so an investor-led platform. Uh, and we invest into private companies across the UK. Uh, we've uh, done over 250 funding rounds in the past five years or so. Um, we also open a, an arm of the business, which is the asset management arm uh, that has effectively funds to invest into private companies as well. And we are now on fund five, and we basically closing a fund every three months or so and deploying the capital into private companies. I am of the opinion that profitability is overrated, but I would say that because we're not profitable yet. Hmm. Hi, I'm Nick Rowe. I'm uh, CEO of Selfie Wealth, a robo-advisory business that offers a variety of B2B and B2C uh, solutions. Um, we're a new company. We're a small company, um, very small in, in, in terms of uh, my esteemed colleagues here. Uh, but um, we are profitable. We're from our launch in Italy last year, albeit only 
a small amount of profitability. Um, do, I, I agree with Jackie in the sense that fintech is a huge universe of, of companies, and I think what it comes down to is, um, particularly in this particular space, the companies that I've seen that have struggled with profitability, it's, it's all been about scale and acquisition of clients, where they decide to put their emphasis, and if it's really been on world domination and distribution, then that's where the expense has been, that's where the difficulty has been in actually making sure that they are profitable. They may be huge in size, but you don't necessarily see where the profitability comes in. So, so I think for us, we're small, we're nimble, we're lean, we can provide bespoke solutions. It's actually relatively easy for us to be profitable, but for some of the firms in this space, and it's a very large space, that do go after acquiring clients and do need to scale, then that's where they, they struggle. If I can just lead on that just a little bit, particularly for someone like Oak North has got to profitability extremely quickly. What would you think are like the key kind of um, tactics to be employed, but, but specifically as a fintech to get to that stage? I mean, I, I think, okay, obviously the fact that we became pro or reached cash break even in 11 months and had 10.6 million pro pre-tax profit in, in our second full year of operations, that's not normal for any business, let alone a, a fintech business. But I think it, the same rule applies to, no matter what kind of business you are. You know, Rishi and Joel are, are co-founders. They bootstrapped their first business and they scaled it over 12 years to 3,000 people and then sold it to Moody's Corporation in 2014. They, they started that business with you know, almost no money and they've kind of take, take, taken that mindset and brought it to Oak North. So uh, you know, every employee is you know, encouraged to obviously negotiate, even if we have raised over a billion dollars to not sort of um, to, to just rest in our laurels or say, well, okay, now we've got lots of money, so we can just now spend uh, frivolously. Um, and I think it's, it's a mindset. You know, it's, it's getting people to think we're, we're a business at the end of the day. We're not going to be irresponsible. We're not going to raise lots of money and then never think about how we can turn a profit. And I also think it's ultimately down to your business model. I mean, our business model is very simple. In the UK, we raise deposits from uh, savers. We have a banking license. That helps to fund our lending to SMEs and the profit we make is the margin between the two. Um, and then outside of the UK, we license our fintech platform, which has helped us to do SME lending so effectively in the UK. We license that to partner banks so they can replicate our model in their own markets. Um, so we don't have to then spend the time and the cost of having to go and apply for multiple banking licenses in multiple markets. And that, again, is a very effective way for us to scale our proposition. Um, in our view, you know, a much more effective way and, and much less expensive and time-intensive way. And you've also managed to achieve no defaults? No defaults on our, on our, on our loan book. Um, so we've lent about three billion in the UK. We've had about 500 million repayments. And um, we've been lending since September 2015. Now obviously that's not to say we'll never have a default. Obviously it has been a, a fairly stagnant economic cycle, but I think the biggest driver behind that is not only down to the fact that, well I guess there's three things. One is the level of underwriting we do. Um, sort of more akin to what you'd find in a private equity firm than what you'd find in a traditional bank. Uh, the second thing is the businesses we're lending to. So we don't lend, I mean, SMEs are such a broad term, 99% of all businesses, but we don't lend to startups. We sort of call them scale-ups. So businesses that are in that next stage of growth um, where they're looking for between sort of half a million pounds up to about 40 million pounds here in the UK. Depending on other markets with our partners, it might be half a million dollars up to about $25 million. Um, so the businesses are profitable, they're established, they might have gone through multiple cycles. Some of the businesses you might have seen around here, Notes Coffee, Leon, the, uh, the naturally fast food chain. So businesses that are quite established. And then the third thing is our monitoring. So we do proactive monitoring of our portfolio. So monitoring the monthly financial and operations data of our borrowers, rather than what you find in traditional banks where there's a tendency to really only look at the data if there's a reason to, like a late payment. And if, do you want to add anything, well, Jackie? You're also if, profitable. Yeah. And so if I were in the shoes of a startup, the way I would think about the model that I'd want to deploy is for, particularly in, in finance, where the problems are extraordinary because it's such an institutionalized industry um, that is um, needed in order to underpin, it's the foundation of commerce. And so if I think about where I would start from a business point of view, I'd start with a fundamental problem. And it's usually a problem that people feel. You know, when you go out, this morning I went to a seller. It was um, a very high-end salon, like a spa. Mm. And their problem was aggregation of data. 
They have lots of different systems. They can't seem to aggregate it between e-commerce and uh, physical payments in their salon. So if you start with the fundamental problem of cohesion, what do you do for cohesion? And just starting with the foundation of understanding the problem and then thinking about product market fit, I think you could really build the foundation of an incredible product so long as you see a big enough opportunity. And then you can extrapolate it across you know, 5.7 million small businesses in the UK. And, um, and so then I think you have to lean into the question of which model matters more? Do you need to build the product out first? Do you have to do any marketing? And does distribution really matter at a point in time? And as you grow and scale, I think the levers of monetization, acquisition, and distribution will need to vary at different points in time. And you have to lean into them at, at various levels. And I think there's no particular model that says you have to go big on distribution. You have to be there first. There are plenty of examples where you know, the number two comes in and can beat mm. the incumbent with a better product. And so I do think it's uh, incumbent upon any entrepreneur to really think hard about where they're at and what product they're, they're building and, and who they're serving. And that, to me, matters more than some philosophical broad swag at you know, whether profitability is good or bad, you know, when you lean yeah, into it, yeah, when you yeah, don't. I see you. We've, we, I think in fintech, it's, it's, it's clear that we've seen a, a bit more of a shift towards companies looking at B2B, maybe when they've even started off at, at, at the B2C style. And I do wonder, and perhaps Gonzalo, Gonzalo given where you sit, looking at many different businesses, what, what do you feel about that? Are we going to see that continue? Um, is it going to e e exaggerate? Yeah. Um, I think, so, so fintech has, the, has, has these two elements to it, uh, what I usually call the fin and the tech. And, and, and I usually mention the fin as being the B2C element of it, and the tech the more B2B element to it. And I mean, Oak North is a great example that you've gone after both markets, right, in, in different geographical regions. But usually, I, th I think there's a lot of confusion in fintech, and people treat fintech as one, where actually the, business, the whole business model, the ethos, the, the go-to-market route is very different whether you're B2C fintech or B2B uh, fintech. And, and that affects the whole company behind it, uh, how you achieve profitability, how quickly you can achieve profitability, your acquisition costs, and so on. And, and what has happened in the past, historically, and, and particularly at the be very beginning of sort of fintech becoming so hyped up and so cool and so on, was that a lot of companies came to market, and, uh, and by the way, ourselves included, right? And we go, oh, we're gonna beat the banks, we're gonna be much better than the banks, and we're gonna, you know, do all these tech buys. And then, of course, we end up, we as a, as a whole, fintech companies end up raising very significant sums of money. Yep. And when you have that, and you're growing, and you have all the growing pa pains, if you, uh, it's very easy to actually throw bodies at the problem rather than just tech. Mm. And if you're not careful, you end up being another bank. Or yeah. certainly with, bless you. Oh, or certainly, <laughs> and, 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 or certainly with, with that sort of level of costs. And that's when a lot of these type of companies like Syndicate Room end up looking back inwards and going, oh, hang on a second, we need to go on a, on a diet here and we need to apply tech again, which yeah, is good point. why we started the business in the first place. And then the efficiency, I mean, in the past 18 months, we more than doubled our revenue and we halved our, our number of people. Mm -hmm. Not by letting anyone go, but as people were going, you automated so much that we don't need to replace them. And that makes a much better model than, than just a, a bank. Nick, you've got a few comments on that, I think. Yeah, I think I, I, um, I disagree slightly with, with what Gonzalo was saying, just because we, we, um, we have a technology solution, what we have built around, whether it's B2B or B2C, is the technology. I think we could make a choice like some of our competitors to go down the route of adding certain services that require a lot of bodies, but then you're, you're drifting away from the FinTech space yep. and you're becoming more financial services proper rather than FinTech in its purest form. So, so for us, um, whilst we have become profitable in Italy with our B2B, our B2C solution, uh, we're finding that, particularly in the UK, since we've been authorized and we're the only pure robo-advisor to be authorized in, in, by the FCA in the UK, that um, we're being um, 
driven towards a, the B2B part or the B2B to C part with mm. institutions coming to us and saying we're developing our strategy on the robo-advisory side. We'd love to use your technology and what you have in different ways to structure our own products. How could you help us do that? So, so we're being, the conversations we're getting into the UK are different to the ones that we're having mainline. mainline. And how important, I mean, not just for your business, but for the, the ecosystem in general, are partnerships. They're, they, they seem to be just increasing in importance. And I'm interested if you think that's incredibly again, important. Kind of I think um, I think for us, particularly because we don't want to be like some of our competitors by adding hundreds of people to drive the business forward in our own way, say down the asset management space, for instance, which we could easily do using the power of the algorithms that we have. Um, so what we're doing is we're partnering up with broker dealers and the asset managers in order to help them structure their own strategy. I think there's a difference though between a partner and a vendor. And I think that's a really important distinction. I think if you're in um, financial technology, you should own your own customer. Mm. And you should be in the business where that relationship is primary to your identity. That is really different than having a partnership that is a license, mm. a structural relationship required because of regulatory reasons. And I think a lot of what folks in fintech have to do is create partnerships that are more driven out of unique regulatory environments. And I think, I'm not sure I'd necessarily call that a partnership. Um, I'd probably more align it to a vendor relationship, even though in many cases those relationships are absolutely critical, but I don't think they need to end, own your end customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just shifting gears a little bit, just talking about the impact of um, uh, funding on, um, on the fintech um, world in general. We're, we're obviously seeing a tremendous amount of capital out there, particularly at later stage, flooding into the market. And whether or not this is actually having um, um, maybe even an undesired effect on uh, the profitability and, and, the, and, the, and the desire to go rather for scale than um, profitability. Do, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, again, it goes back to the, the Silicon Valley bit. I mean, a lot of companies such as Amazon, that's where the myth has come from. You know, and Amazon is the exception, they're not the rule. Yes, they've managed to become an incredibly profitable company. They've managed to reach, you know, one of the highest valuations um, or market caps in the world. Um, but they, they are not like every other company, and they were able to reach a level of scale where the negative unit economics shifted. It's going to be very hard to do that in fintech, specifically because of the fin element. There's not a regulator in the world who's going to let a billion people bank with the same current account. It's different if it's like a billion people mm. with the same ride-hailing app or ordering from the same place to get their food, right? Um, but you, you, in every, you know, every 20 years or so, there's another financial crisis. Um, we're due one. Uh, so to avoid more systemically important financial institutions, you know, you're not going to have a scenario where a billion people are going to be banking with the same bank, and therefore I think businesses need to think about it slightly differently and not kind of get into the habit of saying we want to be the Uber of this or the Amazon of that, because the fin changes everything. Does the, it? the use of capital is very different, um, particularly in lending as a sector in um, some elements of banking where capital is a necessary element of the infrastructure of the organization. That's really different than a use of capital being marketing and distribution. And so I do think the notion of liquidity is just fundamentally different in this business and not necessarily something that breeds um, unlimited growth and acquisition. Mm. Um, and so, you know, as I think about, uh, you know, use of capital, you know, in the world of lending, I think of it as fundamentally driving, you know, the portfolio of loans that we make. As it relates to the organization, I actually think building with constraint is a more thoughtful model. And when you have constraint in a tech company, you're more likely to make really tough trade-offs that help you make better long-term decisions and prioritize what you need to do more thoughtfully than if you're unrestrained in a business and you feel like the capital you have for your products are just fluidly flowing through your uh, company. I, I agree that it, it, it certainly makes you build the company in a more thoughtful way because you just don't have as much cash to be to, to be a bit reckless. 
However, I think that the, the, the importance of profitability is mainly, at a macro level, is mainly driven by where we are on the cycle. And uh, it's the fifth quarter record of uh, capital raised in, uh, to FinTech, at least in the, in the UK. I think it's worldwide, actually, that statistic. Um, but basically, that, that defines that on a company, uh, if you have that potential for growth, then that's the time to go unprofitable and really trade off the, the, the profitability for growth and that requirement mm -hmm. of capital. The moment that capital dries up, that's, the, that's, when it bec that's when it's really important that in the meantime, you, you build the business in a very thoughtful way and you had visibility of uh, how you're gonna become profitable so that you can survive when the capital dries up. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, an example, it's not a FinTech example, but OFO, the, the, the cycle sharing scheme, where basically they, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars they grew all over the world, including in the UK, US, China, and so on. And then suddenly, when the, the backers realize, hang on a second, is there, are, are the, the units, right. the, the economic units, really here or not? And when they realized maybe they're not, and that all they did was they closed the, the funding tap, and the whole, whole company collapsed. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask a different question. Start with you, Nick. Um, given you're all very experienced in, 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 in successful companies and um, what, what, when you look at the fintech space, what type of segments do you think are gonna show the most um, profitability in, in, in the foreseeable future? What are you excited about in, in, in the particular segments? Um, I think from, from our side specifically, because it is such a large segment, um, but for our side, it's, it's the open banking platforms that we're seeing. I think that's very exciting. And certainly uh, not necessarily challenging the big banks because I think the big banks will, will absorb and, and uh, consume some of those very great technology apps and, and, uh, and new companies that we're seeing. Uh, but for our side specifically is um, also the, the, the mystification and the clarity on the asset management side and actually sort of making it much clearer, making accessibility for um, investors, professional investors, general investors, gain access to products that they understand. They understand what they're paying, mm. they understand the fees, they understand the returns. And the clarity of the technology that will come to the forefront in helping bring money to the asset management space, because I think there's a wave of cash obviously coming into that space over the next few years, is, uh, is very exciting for us, because that's the space obviously that we're helping to uh, Who else support and assist. I mean, I think there's, so obviously we use big data and machine learning for our, our platform, Open North Analytical Intelligence. That's obviously an area that we're very interested in and that we're investing heavily in. Reg tech is also a very interesting area. Obviously, one in seven people in financial services are in a compliance role. So um, it has a you know, huge potential to, to change you know, the lives of, of millions of people. Um, but I think probably one of the more, more interesting things is, you know, not which fintechs are going to be, you know, coming out as more interesting in the next few years, but actually what the next few years will do for fintech more broadly. Because as we say, if recessions around the corner, lots of fintechs, ourselves included, are going to really be tested, right? We've been in a very stagnant economic cycle. Most of the, the fintechs that have been born have been born in post-crisis. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, who's sort of left standing uh, in, you know, three, five years' time. And who's not only survived, but actually thrived and proven their proposition. And I think that's going to be um, you know, a, a great opportunity for the sector, but also it's obviously a challenge for many. Just sticking on that point a little bit, you bring up an interesting one. We've, we've really only started fintech at around the crash. It's been around in one regime only, pretty much. Interestingly, we have a Federal Reserve Board governor on the panel here. So, what is fintech doing? How will it? How will those businesses um, suffer? Which segments are going to suffer more, most? What, what, what can be done when this regime changes? It won't always be one of very low interest rates, low volatility, and easy money. Um, is fintech business in general doing enough to think about the macro environment, given that it's only been around in this one period? The, um, there are two places where I would see exposure. Um, one is credit risk, the other is liquidity risk. Um, on credit risk, I think um, there'll certainly be issues with 
some companies that aren't managing duration and defaults thoughtfully. And I think now more than ever looking at long duration lending um, and the impact of what happens when interest rates change to their business model, I think is something that's worth um, an intensity of a view. I think the other issue that comes up for fintech companies in this kind of environment is that liquidity dries up around financing. So even think about basic securitizations and whether the fixed yeah. income market um, just disappears one day. And um, we did see that in certain prior historical markets and it happens very quickly. Um, and I do think those are the two types of resiliencies that fintechs should be um, thoughtful about managing. Um, there are plenty of companies that are well positioned in order to manage that market. Um, you know, I look at our lending business and think because of the, the place we sit in in our payment stream, you know, it's a very unique position. Um, and so I would feel good about that resiliency, you know, and I'd, I'd want to be very thoughtful about, you know, just looking at each company within the market. Mm. Yeah. Uh I think it all comes down to, to the fundamentals. Uh, I think we, we all discussed and we all sort of agree that the cycle will turn. It's more of a matter of when. Uh, but when it, that happens, what every single fintech company needs to do, well, any tech company or any company really, is to make sure that the unique economics are there, you know, that they can survive without having that equity capital investment. And it doesn't mean that they're profitable now, but it means that maybe they will have to take the foot off the, the marketing mm -hmm. budget. It might mean that they have to, you know, to reduce the number of people. Yep. But yep. fundamentally, the business can still operate, can still grow, can still can become profitable. It, maybe the growth rate will decrease as a result of not having that capital yep. to invest in the growth, but the fundamentals are still there. I want to uh, kind of end up here with a, a question about the, um, uh, the biggest mistakes and the best things that you might have seen in your experience that have happened in fintechs building a business. Um, what, what, what are some of the big errors that you see in, uh, in, in businesses that, that have harmed their profitability that you can, that you can comment on? And, and what are some of the best things that you really see or that you believe in <coughs> Um, and that you can advise companies in, 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 in building and that you'd maybe even like to see in your own company that you don't see? Um, you know, one of the things I'm most excited about, and I'm sorry that I'm going to give you a U.S. example, but I think it's a, it's a real point of pride, and I think it's, it's looking forward to a future in the way that um, credit is going to change. And um, I look at who we lend to, and these are like the food truck, the pizza shop, the hair salon, very small businesses across the United States. And because of the way our um, algorithms work, um, we lend based on data only. All of our loans are automated, and we do about 75,000 loans a quarter. And um, one of the more interesting statistics is that 54% of the loans go to women and 37% go to underrepresented minorities. And I think that's a sea change from what's ever happened in the lending space around what success looks like in a business. And I think it's a real point of optimism and a real point of hope that we could see what success is defined as in a business as small as a, a, a one-stand hair salon. And I think that provides an opening for a lot of entrepreneurial activity in the US, in the UK, that I think particularly in light with everything that's going on in the world is really a point of pride, that all it takes is an entrepreneur with a dream, you know, a little reader and um, some opportunity, and they could build their business with credit in the same way that the biggest of the big have, have lent. And I do think um, that will be a fundamental sea change in enabling an entrepreneurial environment in yeah. countries Good all points. around the world. Valentina? Um, so I think some of the, the sort of the learnings, the challenges that we've seen from a few fintechs is obviously, you know, they're scaling so quickly. I think perhaps there's, they've, you know, they've demonstrated already that 
in certain areas, perhaps, whether it's compliance or, con or culture, you know, they've not scaled those teams as quickly as they needed to, um, or as quickly as, as they should have done, and that's then caused challenges later on. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, something that, that we do at Oak North that I, I always think is, uh, I always advise to any other founders um, who might be in the audience or who anyone else who's working for a, a fintech company, obviously a lot of tech companies um, provide, uh, you know, bonus, bonus shares or equity options that might be vesting over time when you join, and that's great. Uh, but I think one of the, the key differences is when you actually give employees the chance to purchase equity as well. Um, because every founder asks, how can I get my team to think like owners? How can I get them to care as much as I do to, you know, to negotiate that much harder? And I think actually if, you, if they're given the opportunity to put their own money in the business, that really shifts the mindset. And I speak as someone who's put their own money um, and invested in, in Oak North. Um, the minimum buy-in is 5,000 pounds. A third of the, uh, of the team have invested the equivalent of a year's net salary in, uh, in Oak North. And that really does shift the mindset because you're doing it because you obviously believe in the proposition and you're thinking for the long term and you're not then making decisions, you know, based on the short term. Nick, what do you think? Uh, I know we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. But I think the best things I've seen about fintech space is when you get small companies with great ideas being able to produce something that can challenge some of the larger banks from a product delivery perspective and, and from a sophistication perspective. I think that's, that to me is a work of art when you see people with, you know, technology solutions that, that you know, solutions for a number of uh, financial issues. I think the worst mistakes I've seen across the board, and here's a large space, is when people start believing their own hype and they diverge away from their core business Good point. into businesses that they don't understand or fully understand the cost of. And, uh, and that's when you see people really struggling to fail and throwing money at it, or because they've got so much capital, so much money that they've raised, they start to diversify and get into areas that they don't truly understand. And Gonzalo's seen many businesses, so. Yeah, uh, w one of the things that, one of the mistakes I, I, I see in a, on, a, on a very recurring basis is the me too's, where it's someone that saw someone else innovating and thinking, ah, oh, I can do a little bit better, so I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, but a little bit better. Guess what, a little bit better is not good enough to make people jump ship. You know, what you'll see about successful businesses is that they are much better than the incumbent at doing something very specific. And the, and the best advice I, I have, it was given to me, so it's not my own idea, but, but it is by far the best advice I've had in terms of my business life, which is the, the focus and the, the three questions that you should really ask about yourself and about the, the company. And the first one is, are you really passionate about what you're doing? Because it's gonna be really hard work. The second one is, can you be the best in the world at doing what you are setting out to do? And then finally, if you answer yes to the first two, you go, can you actually make money out of it? And if you tick all those three boxes, just go for it, you're in for, for as long as you focus and you stay true to those three. Wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoy the panel. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, uh, moderating it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for coming along, spending some time, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest, uh, the earlier parts of the sessions as well. And uh, that's it. It's a wrap. Time to go. Fantastic. Enjoy the drinks. Thank you. Thank you.